just feels like her in here. I used to come in here a lot. I don't come in here by myself much. Nothing's changed in here. Everything's exactly the way she left it. This is exactly the way her room was. It's almost like time stands still. Like this room hasn't changed. Everything else has. But this is constant. Any mother-daughter usually has a special bond, especially she was my first. I really didn't want to have any more after her because she was so perfect. She was my pride and joy. I took her everywhere. Whatever I did, I always included her. Let's see, let's see. It's a heart and a stocking. I was her aunt, and I was her friend, and I was a mother figure as much as I could. I just wanted to be around her as much as possible. Oh, Strut. Yeah. There you go. Put your nose up in the air. Pose. 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 She spent a lot of time at our house, and that's also how she met her boyfriend, Josh. My son and Josh had been best friends since they were four years old. Josh was Sierra's first boyfriend. And Josh had always said that, you know, Sierra was the one. One day I'm going to marry her. She had this confidence about her. I wish that I could bottle that, because there are so many girls that don't have that. And I don't know how she got it. I really don't. But she was just extremely comfortable in the person that she was. And, um, you know, I miss that. It was about 5 o'clock. And I happened to catch Sierra. She was just getting ready to go out for a bike ride. She had got this bike at a garage sale. So she's like, hey, I'm going to take the bike. I'm going to ride over to Josh's for a little bit. It was probably about 9.30. And as I'm coming, I always look, because you can see Sierra's bedroom. And I noticed that her light wasn't on, which struck me as odd. But I didn't feel like I needed to run upstairs and check on my 20-year-old. I just blew it off as, you know, she was probably at Josh's house. Josh called me at 10.30 PM. He actually asked if Sierra was at the house. He said, she's not answering her phone. And he said, that's not like her, and it's not like her. And he had been trying to contact her for uh, hours. We just knew something was terribly wrong. And we all immediately started working on finding her. We live out in the country, so sometimes farmers are carrying heavy equipment, or you've got trucks with large loads. And I thought, maybe somebody hit her. I was calling all of her friends and posting on Facebook and calling hospitals. In my head, I thought maybe she was in a ditch somewhere. My mind couldn't think that something else had happened, but my stomach was telling me different. What time did everybody start to look 
for? I think it was 10. They told the sheriff department that she normally comes home. Um, she doesn't stay out past, you know, 11 o'clock usually, and this is very unlike her. OK, Josh, right? So you, like, just met with her? She just kind of showed up and said, this is my workout. I'm like, OK. She just bought this bike at a garage sale. So he just rode his motorcycle with her? Yeah. Josh and C parted ways, and uh, she was riding her bike home. I just saw around 7 o'clock you were with her. 6.43. Six there were no reported incidents of accidents. They contacted several local jurisdictions and received no information of that. Usually when someone's reported missing, they're not technically considered missing for 24 hours, especially with Sierra being an adult. But they went out and they started searching for her. Check the ditches, alleyways, uh, cornfields check anywhere that a body or a bike or anything could be found. I think that growing up in a small community, everybody really does know everybody. We all knew C. And I think that they took this seriously because they knew that when she was missing, it wasn't by choice. Our gut told us that this isn't right because Sierra would call and it's been too long. Every minute that went by, we're not getting any information. And it's like anything that you hope for is just getting farther farther and farther away from you. It was very difficult. Time was definitely working against us. I can only describe it as being frantic in a, as much of a controlled state as possible. You know, it's, um, we all have kids. Sierra's someone's kid. About midnight, a deputy was traveling down County Road 6 when he looked to the side of the road and noticed a section of corn had been knocked down. He had found that to be odd, so he pulled to the side of the road, exited his vehicle, and proceeded down into the cornfield. He had the spotlight out, and that's when he was searching, and he saw the broken corn stalks. He immediately noticed the overwhelming odor of gas. And then noticed a small fuse box. Finding this to be weird, he began to back out the same path that he went, and then began to look around the roadway. As he was looking on the roadway, he observed two pairs of sunglasses and then proceeded a little bit further down, shined his light in the cornfield. Then that's when he saw the reflector of a bike sitting in the cornfield. We know that Sierra was riding her bike on County Road 6. They went to the last known area where she was at. So he had the flashlight, and he was just kind of combing the cornfield. And he caught the reflector on the bicycle. That bicycle, it was standing up, and it had been backed into the corn, like someone was trying to hide it. Which ultimately led them to believe that there was an abduction. The road was closed. The sheriff wouldn't let us down it. It wasn't 
very much longer that we heard that they had found her bike and it was a couple rows back in the cornfield. Where is she? Because she was so close to home. That's when I think for all of us, it became real. I can see the bike at the end, about 50 feet away from me. It was like all the hair stood up on the back of my neck. There were also blood stains on the handles and on the bike seat. So you knew whoever moved it had blood on their hands, and they were pushing that bike and trying to hide it so nobody would find out what they just did. There is a green sock. We knew that Sierra was wearing green socks at the time of her disappearance. We found a pair of sunglasses hidden beneath the corn. We found an orange-handled screwdriver. There were blood stains on the screwdriver. Somebody was injured in this location, and there was a struggle, but there wasn't enough blood to be like a fatal injury. It was evident that Sierra did not leave that cornfield on her own. One of the crime scene investigators noticed what appeared to be a tire track going down into that ditch line on the right side of the road traveling northbound. That tire track appeared to be that of a motorcycle. didn't want to sleep because you didn't want to miss anything. And you know, you were afraid, you know, well, what happens if they find her? And even if I wanted to sleep, I just couldn't. The thought of, you know, she's out there, we can't find her, and is she scared? <laughs> it was the most horrible feeling I've ever experienced. You know you're up against the clock. You know that you have a certain time frame that you have to attempt to locate that individual. We had neighbors, onlookers, passerbys that saw Sierra traveling on her bike in and around. A local farmer indicated that when Sierra went missing, he was traveling southbound on County Road 6 past the field where we believe Sierra was abducted. And he observed a motorcycle helmet. He had his son jump out of the back of the truck, grab the motorcycle helmet, and throw it into the bed. Investigators immediately noticed a red stain that was both on the interior and exterior of that helmet. That stain appeared to be blood. You could see latent prints on the blood, so you could see prints in blood on the exterior of the helmet. I saw a weapon. I saw something that somebody could knock somebody unconscious with. The evidence that the agents collected pointed to someone being on a motorcycle. And we knew that Joshua was riding with Sierra on that road on a motorcycle. Josh was our primary suspect in that Josh was the last one to be seen with Sierra. We went to Josh's house where a consent search was done. We searched his room. We searched anything and everything that we could find. We collected his clothing that day from his bedroom to see if we could find some blood that would belong to Sierra. We looked at uh, his motorcycle, and we looked over every single inch of it looking for damage, looking for blood, looking for any hair anything that would indicate that that was used to harm Sierra. We couldn't find any blood on it, nothing to indicate that it had been used. We searched his truck and we looked for blood and for hairs and for fibers, anything that could indicate that Sierra had been moved in that vehicle.
we located a pair of uh, brown coveralls, and on those coveralls was a large stain that looked like blood to us. And as we tested it, it did test positive presumptively for blood. He had indicated that he had used those coveralls when he was deer hunting. And um, it was just blood from skinning the deer. We tested the blood. And it tested as animal blood, not human. We did an extensive interview of Josh, getting a story, getting background information. Based on our conversation with him, that was clearly evident that Josh had no involvement in Sierra's death and had no idea where she was. I would never, ever hurt her, or anybody for that matter. Part of me was angry, but they were very adamant about telling me that they need to rule me out. Being the last one to see her, I can see where a lot of people's thoughts can go. I exhausted all the information that I had, drew them a map, gave them my phones, everything to, that I could do to help. There's a big part of guilt that goes with me and what happened. Part of me says you were the last one that saw her, and you should have drove that whole way. She looked at me and said, I'm fine. And I said, OK, I'm going to go home. And we both went our separate ways. I replayed that image probably pretty much almost every day. We knew we had a victim. We knew that she was probably still alive, but we had no clue who our suspect was, and we were trying to find her. Law enforcement was out canvassing the neighborhoods, going door to door, knocking, talking to anyone and everyone that we could. There was a big sense of urgency. We needed to work as fast as we could. The community was amazing. They came out in hundreds to help volunteer to search for Sierra. There's a big white van, and I remember that it was just driving really weird. I believe it, it like, it slowed down. I thought that it was weird at that time of night that I would see that type of a car just around. So I followed it for about a block, and then it took off. Josh and the family were out looking for Sierra. And he observed a white van uh, that he had found to be suspicious. So I followed it for about a block, and then it took off. I couldn't keep up with it, because I was trying to get a license plate on it. We were able to identify that vehicle. We spoke with the female that owned the vehicle. She provided the same account of the story that had taken place, only the fact that she was in fear that somebody was trying to ram her, take her off the road. They looked at the van, they examined it with Blue Star, which is a chemical to look for blood. There was no evidence located in the van. It was clear that that young lady had no involvement in the abduction of Sierra. And I remember that 
night, it really started to sink in that she still wasn't home. We have absolutely no answers. And, uh, you know, and where is she? You know, where is she? That was the question that we had. And we just kept waiting. There were a lot of tasks that needed to be done. And I felt like they couldn't be done quick enough. Knowing she's out there, and we're doing everything we can to find her, but we're still coming up empty. But we were hoping to find her alive. Everything was a blur. Everything was very frantic. I guess you could describe it as an organized chaos. It's almost like losing a child at Disney World. And you look down the main street of Disneyland and you know that your kid's missing, but in Fulton County, it's just cornfield after cornfield after cornfield. And so that you're almost overwhelmed by the thought of, uh, where do you start? Now our focus had to become who, other than these individuals, would have had the potential to have encounters with Sierra as she's traveling on this road. So it was at that time we spoke with the deputies about individuals in the county that may be of interest. Who are our sex offenders in the area? Who are our violent offenders in the area? property sat on approximately one acre, maybe a little bit more of land. It had the main residence in which James lived with his mother. To the right of the main residence was a series of barns. A team of about four of us go to James Worley's house and we knock on the door. Who are you? Yeah, we work on a, a violent crime task force. OK. So and I'm with the state. Okay, so you guys got some suspicions for something here. And James is fairly upset that we're that we're there. So you're gonna tell me that this is all under the guise of just checking every household. Yep. And you're not here for any particular reason. There there's a young lady missing. I'm not out there killing chicks, dude. I don't have relationships. I mean I'm in I'm trying to get one started online a little bit right now. But, uh, and she's been out here, and guess what? She went home alive. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in the house but your mother? Just my mom. OK. Yeah. Is there any reason why we couldn't go in and look? What, what part of the house do you want to look at? We'd like to look through the whole house. He's very angry, very aggressive. His demeanor just kind of shouted that he was dangerous, but reluctantly allows us to look. This is my room here, OK? No dead bodies. It's the laundry room, good luck. Our hope was to find Sierra alive. And you know, as time passes, you get more and more worried. So as much as we could, we looked. And we looked, and then we looked for signs of Sierra. I have to kill anybody and get that straight. Well, believe it or not, being cooperative was always good. Yeah, right. I listen. Even if I was a psychopath, I had to go and shot you all. Nah, I'm too quick for that. Yeah, I don't think so. You're saying you've killed before and you know. I'm just saying, sir, and that's not cool to say that to me. And then Mr. Worley, he gives us a tour around his property. You run a business here? Is that what I'm seeing? I, uh, I do a little bit here and there. The first building that you would come to was a workshop 
and which James used to fix motorcycles, do small engine repairs. Well, I'm a get it done kind of guy, and I want to get you guys out of my Well, here. we're doing good so far. I think every step that we took on that farm, he became more anxious. When we walked into that barn, it was very tense. Mr. Worley seemed very agitated, very angry that we were there. Rick. I started to become even more worried when I looked at the floor. So what do you use this for? I'm going to buy a calf. I plan on doing it about this time this year. Rick. And there were rake marks through the dirt, like someone was trying to conceal what had happened there. Is that gonna do anything? Let's get out of here. It's hot, man. As we were moving the bales of hay, that's when the things started becoming a little bit more uh, peculiar. We removed the bales of hay and we uncovered a wooden green box surrounded all the way around with chicken wire. It looked like an animal crate. That's just that I got for storage. And sorry about the mess, but this is how it ends up when you're doing everything by yourself. Yeah. There's nothing in here. Come on, you got another section over here you can look at. And he opened it up, and he could see inside that there was lingerie and other things that just completely out of place for that setting. What's all the undergarments for? What's all the what? That's all girlfriend stuff. And James told him, you need to close that immediately. What the is wrong with it? Nothing. You give it out? Yeah, when I go out with people. What's wrong with getting stuff to, to treat girls? They like that Hey, listen. That's don't make no, it up. You're going to try to take it. this and build some Thing up Absolutely. the ladder. He's saying he felt strange about it. That it's down the way it did, and I don't have a voice in it, and nobody wants to listen to us. I really struggled with the weight, and there was nothing. There was no, no information coming in, and just to to, to sit and wait was the hardest part. It was, it was disturbing to step into that barn. The identifying and locating this box in there raised our concerns, one, for why would it be stored under bales of hay? in a barn so far from the house. Inside that box were numerous unusual items. Mr. Worley indicated that every piece of clothing that was in that box was brand new, uh, had never been worn. But we then located a pair of purple underwear. Those purple underwear had what appeared to us to be red staining in them. We really recognized that. We we understood that we were on the right path. We had the right person. The lingerie stuff. Dude, that stuff's all been bought new during the last year and a half. Oh, you gotta ask I first. have a business plan, and that's gonna be, that's gonna be walled off. And this is gonna be a studio. It's a... Uh... Porn. I'm going to be a producer. Pro producer here. Okay. Pornography. Stuff there, right? oh, yeah. He indicated that he was intending on creating some type of porn studio. Hey, listen. I've never hurt anyone, killed anyone, raped anyone. He denied ever seeing Sierra, ever encountering Sierra, ever having any involvement. My sister and I were laying on the pull-out couch, and I remember her phone rang, 
and they told her that they had arrested James Worley. Our minds are going a mile a minute. Who is he? What happened? And has he said where she's at? I'm joyful that they made an arrest, but my big question is, where is Sierra? So you've made an arrest, but where's my daughter? I was hoping I was going to open a door and she was going to be laying there or something. I, I was wishing we were finding her. It was disturbing to step into that barn and to see the um, bales of hay arranged. The only way I can describe it is, is that it was set up to look like almost like a four-poster bed. That someone would put a mattress in the center of all of those bales, and then to see the mattress behind a piece of plywood, and then to see the door spray painted black from the inside. As soon as we started to process that scene, those hay bales came out very quickly. We wanted to know what was going on in that area. He had sexual devices in the storage crate. Everything about that barn said kidnapping, abduction, and sexual assault. While we were searching the far barn and removing the bales of hay, we noticed a piece of plywood that was sitting on the ground. We find a, a piece of um, board on the floor with air holes cut into it. That piece of plywood was then removed from the ground. Upon lifting that up, we observed a small couple cubic feet freezer. That freezer was submerged into the ground and had a toe strap up around the sides as if one were to put that on so that the top couldn't come open. As we took that board off and we saw that freezer, I think for a split second, you hope that you find someone who's alive and whole inside of that freezer. We then proceeded to open the lid. Sierra was not inside. It's empty. The inside of that freezer was carpet lined and smelled of chemical. It smelled to me like bleach, like someone had cleaned it. There's carpet inside and there's evidence that bad things happened inside of that freezer. But there's still no Sierra. I want to find her alive. Dude, I don't have, I do not have her stashed, hidden, buried, whatever it is you're thinking. I haven't done it, don't know, I have no answers. I'm just not the guy. If I was going to attack a chick, would I leave, you th and I've been around the block, would I leave any evidence whatsoever to be found? He had an answer for anything that we presented to him. The freezer being located was an area where he would hide his weed. The air mattress located in the barn was used for his camping. For every question, Mr. Worley provided us with some type of answer. We located zip ties that could be used to subdue people. We located duct tape, ski masks. It was almost like he had a to-go kidnapping bag. A farmer not far from the abduction site and Mr. Worley's house had located something that he found unusual. determined was that she asphyxiated. I felt like we failed at some point. We were going so fast to try to find her, and then I felt like we 
If we could have been a little quicker, we may have saved her. When we found out, I remember people screaming. The crushing feeling that comes from that is pretty incredible. Time stopped. The only relief that I felt was that they actually had found her. Because the thought of going through another day of having no answers, not knowing where she was, was horrible. Getting that phone call put an end to all of that. Um, but it also put an end to her. The, the despair, the emptiness that you feel is immediately replaced with anger. She's not coming home. And you think, she was just here. She was just here and we have plans and she's gone. After Josh and Sierra parted their ways, James Worley saw Sierra riding her bicycle. We believe he passed her on County Road 6. And at that point, he decided to take Sierra. That he probably struck her with his helmet. Knocked her into the ground and, and then drug her into the corn, tied her up. We really believe that he put her inside of that truck and then took her back to that barn and assaulted her. Her DNA was located on the air mattress. Blood was on the pair of pink underwear. There was a piece of duct tape located in the barn. That duct tape had Sierra's DNA on it, and it also had James Worley's DNA. There was an ornate key that had been attached to the handcuffs that were used to bind Sierra, and a matching key was found on James Worley's keychain. We were able to tie Sierra and James Worley to every single scene we processed. James Worley was found guilty in the abduction and murder of Sierra Joggin and sentenced to death. We obviously were happy with the verdict, but it didn't feel good. I would like everyone to remember the light and the big smile she had. Simply just walk in and the whole room's just kind of lifted a little bit. That's what I hope people remember about her. Is it full, Cece? I enjoyed watching her grow up. She was just an, was just an amazing kid. It was just looking to the, the next stages of, of life. And unfortunately, we didn't get that, though. Happy birthday to you. I love Mama and me. I love you, too, Susan. I chose not to focus on what we lost and focus on how lucky we were to have had her. Amazing memories. And so that's how I cope. Oh, 
the memories. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't change anything. This for Sierra helped us heal because all of the passion that Sierra had for life, we put into that. She became my purpose and am driven.